Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn in your Bibles today to James chapter 3, verse 18. It says, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, I want to ask you something this morning. Are you someone who makes peace? When you enter into a conversation, when you enter into a room, do you bring peace with you? Or do you bring contention and strife? The answer to that can sometimes determine why you're receiving or not receiving what it is that you're praying for. See, we must understand that God is not like a heavenly slot machine where your prayers, you throw up a prayer to see if it'll work, and you pull down the prayer lever, and then you, you watch these things turn around, you know, these like a little slot machine, and you go... Ka-ching, 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 there's a one praying hands. Ching, 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 there's another, and then you get a banana. Well, I guess maybe it just wasn't my day. God wasn't in a good mood. Maybe if I can just get a whole lot of people pulling the slot machine. Now, here, here's the thing. God's will for you is for you to be healthy. God's will for you is for you to have peace. God's will for you is for you to have fulfilled in your life what he has planned for your life. Now, there's too many people that are sad and depressed. One of the leading causes of death in the United States is suicide. And that's because people have given up and they just don't know where to turn. They get depressed, and they start looking back. And one of the things that they look back toward is what they wanted 20 or 30 years ago, and they see now it hasn't happened. In other words, what I would call unfulfilled expectations. Too many people are where they are right now, and what they're saying is, I didn't realize this is where I would be right now. I thought by the time I was here, I would have peace. I thought by the time I was here that I would have the accomplishment that I wanted to have. And unfulfilled expectations has one thing that you don't need, and that is you always look to the past, looking back. And the Bible tells us that we're to press forward. We're not supposed to look back. You you cannot be going forward while you're looking back. If you do, you'll stumble. You'll never get anywhere if you keep looking back. Now, a lot of us have got a lot of things to look back upon, a lot of problems, a lot of strife, a lot of hurts. A lot of things happened we really didn't want to happen. But you don't have to be living with the past today. You cannot let the past determine your future. There's some things you've got to let go of and some things you've got to hold on to. And it's just knowing the difference. I'll never forget years ago, I was at a minister's convention and the, the evening speakers were flying in and flying out. The guy would fly in on the night he was supposed to speak and the next day he would leave. So in other words, the evening speakers weren't listening to each other. And so the evening speaker one night was saying, you've got to hold on to what it is that God's got for you. And he got real dramatic and he you know he you gotta hold on to what and his whole theme the whole night was you gotta hold on well the guy flew flew in the next night and he preached you gotta let go (laughs) you know you and and i'm hearing these sermons and i don't know whether i'm supposed to hold on or let go well let me tell you something the bible does talk about holding on and letting go but you gotta hold on to the dream that God's given you that's ahead of you and you got to let go of the past failures and you got to quit 
thinking in terms of, well, it could have been, it should have been, it might have been. No, you you got to understand that today, and I know it's, it's an old bumper sticker, but today is the first day of the rest of your life. You've got to realize that God's got a plan for you, and no matter how far off the plan you have gotten, you can get right back on track, and you can get to where you would have been if you'll just let God map out the plan instead of you trying to map out the plan. Let's go to James chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and you covet, and you cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask, and you don't receive, and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You know, one version of the Bible says you ask with the wrong motives. See, you, you have got to walk on the plan that God has for your future and not the plan that you want for your future. I am so glad that I didn't get what I wanted when I was 18. Because I would be one drunk, drugged, dead rock and roll star. You know, that was supposed to be humorous, but it's true. See, look, we hear a lot of preaching about deliverance, and we hear a lot of preaching about healing and prosperity. But let me tell you something. If you're, if you're living your life with a broken heart, nothing's really going to sink in. It's really hard for people to receive healing when they have a broken heart. It's hard for people to get revelation from the Word of God and understand what's going to take place in the future if you have a broken heart. You know, there's going to be a day in this country, let me tell you this, and I, I can tell you that this is true, there will be a day in this country where we will have evil leadership and we will have, if we still have a Congress, we will have a Congress and a Senate and a judicial branch full of evil people. It's going to happen. How do you like that prophecy? You know when it's going to happen? One day after the rapture. Because the church that restrains will be gone, and then evil will rule. And we have this tribulation period. But we're not there yet. We are the glorious church. We are still here. We are that that thing that restrains the enemy. We have been given authority and power over all the, all the works of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means harm us. There is no reason why we should fail at all. And as long as we're here, righteousness should reign. And it will. Well, here's, here's the thing. Jesus came to heal the broken heart. Let's take a look at Luke 4.18. Jesus was talking in the synagogue, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Your heart can be broken for a lot of reasons. It can be broken because financially everything is a mess. It can be broken because your kids are a mess. It can be broken because someone that you loved left you. Abandon you. You can be brokenhearted because your parents beat you, abuse you. But the Word of God says that Jesus can heal the brokenhearted. Not just deal with it, He can heal it. Matt, jump up here for a second. Come on up here. Oh, did you see how he did that? Put your hands. Now, when I press, you press. Okay. Okay? Okay. Now, here's what was happening. When I would back off and not press too much, he wouldn't press too much. When I would press harder, he would press harder. Just kind of a natural instinct. Thank you. 
What he was doing is he was coping with, he was coping with the pressure that was upon him by exerting equal and opposite pressure. But even though he was coping with it, I didn't go away. I was still there. And sometimes he would have to press harder, and sometimes he wouldn't have to press as hard. And maybe sometimes he could just stand there and not press at all. But as soon as I would start to press, he would start to press. That's called coping. That's the definition of coping with a problem. God does not want you to cope with your problems. Now look, I'm going to get some flack for this. I always do. I've mentioned this before, and it generates emails. But I'm going to tell you again. I am not, and you need to understand this, I am not against people getting counseling. I am not against Alcoholics Anonymous and different programs where you get a coin for so many weeks or years or months or whatever. I'm not against that. That's better. Look, it's better to have a 10-year coin in your pocket and to say you're an alcoholic but you haven't drank in 10 years. It's better to be there than it is to be the person who's out drinking. That's better. But now let me tell you something. That's coping with the problem. That's coping with the problem. God, in his word, doesn't tell us to cope with the problem. He tells us to eliminate the problem by being set free so that you don't have to cope with it. It's just not there anymore. Now, somebody may say, well, well that's not going to work for me. It will not work for me. And you're right, it won't. Because the Bible says you get what you say. The Bible says you receive what you believe. And if you don't, want, if you don't think it's going to work for you, it won't. If you are totally convinced that you've got to live the rest of your life coping with a problem, dealing with situations, then you will live the rest of your life coping with and dealing with situations. And that's better than not doing it. Are you following me? But God's plan is for us to be set free so that we don't have to cope and deal with, so that we don't have addictions and problems and things pressing on us. We're free. Jesus didn't fight problems. He conquered them. He didn't say, well, guys, you woke me up, and I know there's a storm out there, but we're just going to have to deal with it. Why don't you just head the boat over into the waves a little bit because the boat won't get... No, he didn't, he didn't tell them how to deal with the storm. He stopped it. And as long as you're trying to deal with things from the past and work out things from the past, you're going to get stuck in the past. And let me tell you something. Your past will keep you from moving forward. It doesn't mean that you don't remember what happened in the past. But it does mean this. You don't have to let the past drag you down. You can remember the past without the pain. We had a lady that went to this church. She was a dear saint of God, went for years. The first time she came into church, I'll never forget, I met her at the back door probably 20 years ago. And she said, and she was grumpy and she was mad. And she was upset. And her husband said that's just the kind of the way she lived because her granddaughter had been murdered in St. Louis and they had never found the guy that murdered, murdered her. And some other things had happened in her life and she was bitter. And when, when she was a young girl, she had a relative that abused her sexually, took away her innocence, and she had lived all of her life with that hovering over her. And she was up in her 60s maybe, yeah, probably at that particular time, probably in her 60s. She got set free. It didn't happen all at once, but here's how it happened. She started getting into the Word of God, and she began to start believing what the Word said instead of what she had thought would happen. See, she had convinced herself, I'll never get over this. This is something I'm going to have to live with the rest of my life. This pain is always going to be with me. The counselor told her, the counselor told her you're going to, just going to have to cope with it. 
that pain will never go away. You'll just have to cope with it. Well, according to what Jesus said, the pain can go away if you can defeat it. But you can't defeat it unless you believe you can defeat it. And you can't get rid of the past as long as you're holding on to it. And some people have made the past their identity. They're so caught up in the past and talk about the past so much that they've developed friendships based upon the past. There are people that go to the groups because the group has become their family. There's some people that go to the psychologist and psychiatrist. I'm not talking to everybody. I'm just saying some people go to the, the psychologist because the psychologist has become their friend. And they treat their psychologist like they would treat a chiropractor where you just go in and get an adjustment. Let me tell you something. You can get an adjustment one time with Jesus, and you don't need an adjustment anymore. So, Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3.13. Brethren, this is Paul talking to the church. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. You see that? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Now, if you research this out in context in the original Greek language, that forgetting those things which are behind doesn't mean that you don't have memory of them. It means that they don't control you. you. You remember the historical event of the past, but you have overcome the pain of that event. You're able to talk about it in such a way that you can minister to somebody else and you can say, hey, look, I know you're hurting from that, but... But let me give you some comfort. I've been through that. You don't say, that's where I am right now, too. No. You say, I've been through it. In other words, I used to be there, but I'm not there anymore. There is a place on the other side of pain called paradise. And you can be there. And this is not just some fairy tale. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Now let me ask you something. When Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished, and then he went to heaven, do you think the Father, now I'm saying this facetiously, Father, do you think the Father said to him, well, son, how'd you do? And Jesus said, well, I did pretty good. I did everything that you told me to do, except that one thing. Somehow I just didn't do enough to heal their broken hearts. No. Let me tell you something. If Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, then he did everything that needs to be done to have your broken heart healed. So if he has done everything that needs to be done to heal your broken heart, and your broken heart's not healed, are you going to blame him? Uh, let me ask you this. Is it proper to pray, dear Lord, take away my broken heart? Let me tell you something. This may sound odd to you, but when you ask God to heal your broken heart, that's an incorrect prayer. Because he's already, now listen to me, he's already done everything that needs to be done for your heart to be healed. It, it operates on the same principle as salvation. If somebody is a lost person and they want to become a Christian, do they pray, Jesus, do something so that I can get saved? No. Why not? Because he has already done everything. He has paid the price. His blood is sufficient. There's no more sacrifice needed. He put his blood on the altar in heaven on the day of his resurrection. And the perfect price was paid for your salvation. All you have to do is receive it. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You've got to believe that God raised him from the dead. And you've got to speak it. 
and then you're saved. Well, how do I receive a healed heart? You receive a healed heart the same way. You've got to believe that Jesus paid the price for your healed heart. You've got to believe that nothing else needs to be done. And you've got to start saying it. In Mark eleven twenty three, 23, let's, let's put that scripture up. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, you've heard it a thousand times. Now you're going to hear it 1,001. Jesus said this. Now, if, if you're looking in your Bible, for those of you who are home looking in your Bibles, this is red letter. Jesus said this, for assuredly I say to you, now look at what he's saying here, whoever says to this mountain, now the mountain is a, is a kingdom. Many times in the Bible when it talks about the mountain of God, it's talking about the kingdom of God. Well, what mountain is it talking about here? The kingdom of darkness. Whoever says to this mountain, now see he's just finished a little bit before, giving his disciples authority over all the power of the enemy. So he's explaining this even deeper. Whoever says to this mountain, you have to say it. You just can't think it. You have to say it. There's power in your words. Be removed and be cast into the sea. And does not doubt in his heart. So it's not just saying it. you got to not doubt in your heart. But what do you not doubt in your heart? What is it that you do not doubt? does not doubt, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Are you following me on this? That's Jesus. He's saying if you believe in your heart that what you say will be done, you will have whatever you say. And you cannot continue saying, I'll never get over this. The pain is just too great. I'm going to live with this till the day I die. If you only knew what they did to me, you would understand. If you knew how bad I had it, then you would know what I'm talking about. You would understand why I'll never get over this. And with that attitude and with those words, let me tell you something, you'll never get over it. Because to get over it, it takes the anointing of the power of the Word of God, and Jesus said you've got to believe in your heart that the price that he has paid is enough. Hmm. Somebody may say, well, so... What you're saying is we just got to, once again, we got to forget everything that's happened? No. The Bible tells you what to remember and it tells you what to forget. Take a look at Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns, your loving, crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Back it up one verse to 103, 2. 103, verse 2 on the jumbotron. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and what? And forget not all his benefits. See, you, you need to remember everything that God's done for you and start Forgetting what the devil has done to you. Hmm. Deuteronomy 1.6 says, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. You know, you've been around this mountain way too many times. You know, you all know this. We, we learned this as a child. The definition of insanity is when you keep doing the same thing over and over and over, and each time you do it, you expect a different result. Well, that's not going to happen. See, nothing's going to change until something changes. Now, I know you can take a crowd like this, and you can start over on this side, and you can go all the way across the auditorium, over to this side, and you could, I could take each one of you and bring you into my office and interview you, and we could sit down with a cup of coffee or a bottle of 
Coca-Cola or something and, and have a half an hour chat. And if I pressed long enough, you probably have some things in your past that have been very hurtful, that you've covered up, that you, you're coping with from time to time. Everybody's got a past, but we need to forget that. And as believers, <clears throat> we have a future. Wow, and it's a good future. It's a good future. Well, Psalm 78, 41. Psalm 78, 41. <clears throat> it says, yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, without getting into the entire story of this, let me tell you something. God has done everything for everybody in the whole world to get saved. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Who did he love? He loved the whole world. Is the whole world going to get saved? No. Why not? Because the whole world doesn't believe. See, Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that, here's a qualifier, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God... It's, the Bible says that God desires that none should perish. He loved the entire world. Is the entire world saved? No. Well, what does that tell us? That tells us this. God doesn't get what he wants. God doesn't always get what he wants. If he did, the whole world would be saved. If he did, the whole world would be healed. Well, then, why doesn't he get what he wants? Because God has set a plan into motion with spiritual laws. And he gave us his law book here. This is the law book. And even though we're in the age of grace, the spiritual principles still apply. And as we read a few moments ago, Jesus said, you get what you say. And you only receive what you believe. You're not going to receive salvation unless you believe in salvation. You're not going to receive healing unless you believe in healing. And you're not going to receive a healed heart unless you can believe that your heart can be healed. Every failure in life of a believer can be traced back to a lack of believing and dwelling on unrealistic, unfulfilled expectation. I like what Robbie said in his message, which, by the way, last Thursday night was amazing. You need to, need to watch that. But he said in one of his messages that, uh, and Robbie was, he played in, uh, well, he's played, Robbie's played football in Arrowhead Stadium and uh, up at uh, Faro Field at MU. But uh, in the state championships, but his coach told him that when you're running, if you look back to see how close the guy is behind you that's trying to catch you, you'll lose a half a step. The last thing in the world you want to do when you're, when you're running and you don't want somebody to catch you is looking back. You don't want to look back. Looking back will slow you down. Spiritually, it's the same principle. Looking back will slow you down. We've got to quit looking back at what could have been, should have been, might have been, and press forward to what God's plan is for us. Faith does not live in the past. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the evidence of things not seen. Quit saying, I can't imagine that. If you can't conceive it, you won't receive it. Somebody may say, well, I thought imagination was of the devil. That's what New Age people do. No, the New Age people stole it. The Word of God says, cast down vain imaginations. But if God has given you an imagination, here's what we call it. God has given you a dream. And he wants that dream fulfilled. And you say, well, I missed it. Quit saying you missed it. 
Say, God, get me back on track. In my car, and probably everyone in here, we got these new fang-dangled devices called GPSs. And what you got to do is you, you, you got to use your GPS. Every now and then, I think I know more than it knows. And we're going someplace, and I don't listen to it. And we get to where I think we're supposed to go, but we're not there because... I was wrong. But you know what I can do? I can hit a button on my GPS and it says recalculate. And it will get me back to where I was supposed to be. It may take a different route to get there. But it gets me to the same place. And that's what a lot of us need to do when it comes to our spiritual dreams that God has given us. We've gotten way off track because we've tried to do it ourselves. But all you got to do is just say, God, reset, reset, get me there, and let him get you where you're supposed to go. It may be a different way than he originally planned, but it's the same destination. Isn't that good? All right. If you'd only known what I went through, you don't know my past, pastor. You know what I think about that time? No, but I'm getting ready to know it. <laughs> you know, there's some people just love to tell you about their past. And it's okay sometimes to share what has happened. Don't, I mean, let's don't get weird on this. That doesn't mean you can't tell somebody what's happened. If I need somebody to pray for something, the last thing in the world you want to do is say, pray for me, and they say, what about? You go, can't tell you. It's an unspoken request. You don't find that in the Bible. How can I pray for something if I don't know what it is? You know, I get prayer requests by email constantly. Every day I get prayer requests to say, Pastor Allison, pray for me. What? Pray for your healing, pray for your finances, pray for your kids, pray for wh what? It's okay to ask me to pray, but give me something to pray about. <laughs> like a couple days ago, I want you to pray for my friend. I can't tell you who it is or what's wrong, but just pray. Dear Lord, do something with somebody. I don't know what you're supposed to do. Amen. Okay. If that was you and you're watching online, I apologize. No, I don't. You needed to know that. All right. Hebrews 10.39. We are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Now, this is a time of acceleration. This is not a time to draw back. This is a time to say, God, I'm going to go where you want me to go, and you take your foot off the brake, take it out of reverse, put it in drive, and hit the accelerator. You know what? You can get to where God wants you real quick. You say, well, it takes too long to do that. See, people have excuses. We all do. I do. I mean, I have. I don't anymore. I quit, I quit doing excuses. But people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm too old. Or, and some people say, I'm too young. I, I remember when I was a young person and I was traveling around to full gospel businessmen, everybody there had gray hair. And I didn't. I had blonde hair. And they didn't want to listen to somebody with blonde hair. They wanted the wisdom of gray hair. But I remember going to Walmart saying, I'd like some gray dye. They said, we don't have gray dye. And I would have looked goofy anyway. You know, it's a 22-year-old guy with gray hair. Don't let the fear of failure rob you from your forward progress. But what if I fail? If you have faith, you won't. Faith never fails. You know, Robbie came up with something else. I, I've been preaching my son's sermons lately. But by the way, uh, he came up with something else a few years ago. He's saying, Dad, people talk about faith failures. He said, there's no such thing. That's an oxymoron. Faith never fails. That's true. 
And thank you for your enthusiasm on that. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's about time for me to uh, sum it up here. Many people are looking for a new revelation. Did you know that? People go to a meeting and they want to hear a word from the Lord. I do that. I go to meetings and I'm thinking, I sure hope God speaks to me. But let me tell you something. I've discovered over the years, and now I have real gray hair. The Bible says that's wisdom. I've come to the conclusion that most people don't need a new revelation from God. Most people need to go back to the basic foundational principles in the Word of God. See, sometimes we're wanting something new because we feel what we've heard before didn't work. But what we've heard before should work. And what is it that we've heard that we are getting complacent about? Let me tell you what God's Word has said to you, and this is very basic. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Now, I'm not saying don't receive a new revelation, but I'm just going to say this. Instead of looking for a new revelation, desperately, focus in on that. You have authority. How much more powerful can that be? You have authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing, no thing shall by any means harm you. That's a verse you've heard all your life. Focus on that. Let me give you another one. You have the Holy Spirit within you, so greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Focus on that. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You don't need to be afraid of the world. Why? Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. When you have tasks to do, when you have things you need to do, and you get apprehensive, go back to a basic principle. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if I have something come against me, doesn't matter, because greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And if there's a plan coming against me, then I'm going to go to another basic principle. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. The enemy may have a Remington deer rifle pointed at you with a bullet in the chamber and his finger on the trigger and you are in the bullseye of the sights. <laughs> but if you can believe that no weapon formed against me will prosper, and you say that, it becomes a part of your confession, and you believe in your heart that those things you say will come to pass that God's promised, then when the enemy goes to pull the trigger, the bullet will jam. Something's going to go wrong. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. And we have 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. You know, it's so simple. Just believe what God says and then say it. You say, well, I did that and it really didn't do much. Well, you've got to believe it in your heart. So how do you believe it in your heart? You keep hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and saying it and saying it and saying it. And if you hear it enough and say it enough, it'll get in your heart. That's how, that's how brainwashing works. The Bible says we can have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> Some of us need, we need our brains washed and get all of the junk of the past out, and get the promise of the future in, and understand the reality that no weapon formed against us will prosper. 
How about that? Romans 10, 17. How does faith come? Faith is believing God. How can you believe God? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. That could also be translated in the Greek, which by the way, Loretta and I took many years of Greek. We took many years of ancient Greek classes together in college. Actually, I took one year over again just because she was in the class. I didn't tell anybody that it was my second time taking that class. And that way when I aced all the tests and everything, everybody thought, wow, he's smart. They didn't realize I'd already gone through it once. But at any rate, that can also be translated, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing. Hearing what? The word of God. You want to get faith? You got to hear and hear the word of God. It doesn't say faith comes by having heard. Somebody say, well, I've heard that before. Well, maybe you heard that before, but you don't have any faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing. Well, I think it's time that we stop and put all of this into practice. Stand up. We're going to make our confession. I am letting go of the pain in my past, and I am reaching forward to take hold of the goal, hold of the, goal. The, dream the dream that God has put in my heart, put in my heart. No, weapon no weapon formed against me will prosper I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me no weapon formed against me will prosper I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I believe it. I receive it. Amen. God bless you all.